begin with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. We meet together, study calculus, and I just thank you for these students who understand the importance of academics. Help us to uh, glorify you in what we do this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so Stokes' theorem. So the theorem is this. The surface integral um, over some surface, S, of the curl of a vector field, that ds vector is equal to the line integral over the boundary, consistently oriented boundary of the surface um, of f dot dr. Now here we assume that f is, let's say, smooth on and also near S. Um, and S is simply connected. OK, there's the fine print. So what does it mean for a surface to be simply connected? Yeah, no holes. So roughly speaking, it could it could look something like maybe like a well, I'll tell you what, maybe it could be easier for me to picture. Let's, let's suppose it looks something more like this. All right, it doesn't have to have, I mean, it could have some corners. It has to have a, the boundary has to be, this, this boundary is a piecewise smooth boundary. And it's, it's induced from S in the natural way. So now S, of course, has, um, you know, some sense of normal. <coughs> so, you know, this, this surface S, there's some, you know, normal direction for S, right? And if that's the if that's the normal uh, to S, right? Then what 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 direction is the boundary of S? You have to imagine yourself like. Here we go. If you can imagine him walking along the edge. If he's walking in the positive sense, then the surface should be on his left. Assuming he's walking on the top of the surface as defined by the normal. So the boundary of S is defined like this direction, in this direction, and then over here like that. Right? <coughs> All right, so I'd like to point out that you could take any surface, right? And you can kind of do like the thing I did the other day. You could just pick some points in it, let's say. And um, if you pick enough points, If you play this game, right, you can approximate the surface with some kind of polyhedra, right? You can imagine taking the surface and replacing it with sort of this union of plaques of like little little bits of a plane in different with different normals, right? That would give you an approximation to the surface, right? That makes sense. And if we t t take more and more and more points, we get a better and better and better approximation to the surface as we do this, right? Now, let's just focus, let's think about just one of these, say this one, right? Um, 
Well, let me draw it a little bit differently. Just think about that one one. Okay, so the normal is like this, right? And um, <clears throat> let's see here, a little bit of color coding. Here would be the outside edge of it, right? That would be like this piece. But you see the inside edges, well, they're all going to be met by their reversals at the join, at where they join with the other plaques here, right? The other tiles. See that? Like this one and this one and, okay, this one. But those are, those are going to be, in the end, they're going to be canceled out by the corresponding reversal cur curves which are reversed on the other edges. Do you see that? because this one would be like this. See that if we, if we, if we tile the surface, we're, we're, we got a bunch of little, little tiles where any of the inner edges, if they're consistently oriented, only the outer edge would like remain if you added, if you added the line integral around every little tile in the sum, all of the in, inner edges cancel because you have the line integral one way, the line integral the other way. And so they all cancel out. The only thing you'd be left with, as you integrate, as you add up the in line integrals of all the all the all the tiles together, is the outer edge. Yeah. So this pretty much is a 3D version of a scale. Yes, we're getting there. Now that that, in, yeah, we made that argument in Green's theorem, right? Yeah, actually, yes. It's a it's kind of a bubbled out version of that. Um, <coughs> I did want you to see that. Good to see that. Now, we proved Green's theorem already, right? And Green's theorem, one of the forms of it was this. The integral over a region R, a subset of the plane, right, of the curl, um, yeah, yeah, the curl of F dotted with Z hat dA. was equal to the integral of f dot dr over the boundary. I mean, this, I mean, here I have in mind, of course, the region is something like this, right? Here's, um, you know, z hat, here's r. So <clears throat> I mean you can let f equal to pqr if you like but the fact of the matter is that in this uh the r drops out to 0 if you just take the dot product through z hat right so i mean really what you see is if you write it in the language of surface integrals we do have the surface integral of the curl of f um, dot ds is equal to the integral over the boundary of f dot dr. In the case that we're looking at the xy plane, right? But think about this. Think about this. I can put xy coordinates if I want on any one of these tiles. What are xy coordinates? coordinate system, I can just as well define xy coordinate systems based on any one of these points being the origin. And so I can just redo that theorem again with those new xy coordinates for each one of these tiles. And so I get Green's theorem on every tile. And so I get that the integral of the curl of a vector field dot with the normal to one of these tiles is simply equal to the integral of the vector field over the boundary of each tile by what we've already done. And then you just add them together and take the limit as the number of tiles go to infinity. And there you have it.
<clears throat> Some of you will not be content with this as a proof. You're like, we're content. No need for another proof. What are you talking about? Nonsense. It's too late. It's too late. I've already started into it. Oh, the audio is working, right? Okay, it's a little late to ask, but. <laughs> like, no. All right. Um, oh, come on. Where'd you go? Stupid notes. Where is the. Come on. Where'd you go? Oh, no, not that. Oh, here it is. But I, you know, that's the thing that's so striking, Mike, is that this is exactly the same argument as I gave for Green's theorem. But we can equally well do it on the curve space. I mean, it's, it's really nice, right? So here's the argument I just went through. Here's a slightly better picture of it. Again, the idea is just that I can do Green's theorem on each one of these because if you just trade z hat for n hat and u and v, the coordinates on that thing, we can go through the same arguments, prove Green's theorem on each uv coordinate system, and then just add them together, essentially. So the, the proof is mostly in the picture, like I said, but if you add up, you just take the sum of the line integrals over each one of the uh, over each one of the tiles, that will be equal to the sum of the area integrals over the tiles. Now, the sum of all the area integrals gives you the integral over the union of the tiles of the curl by the usual definition of surface integral, and the integral over the boundary of the tiles again just gives you the integral of the outer boundary because the inner boundaries cross are, are cross cuts that cancel their reversals wherever there's an inner, inner edge, and that that. That, that, that's almost it, but you know, there's also this idea that you have to pass to the limit of the number of tiles going to infinity. And there's some, I mean, there's some really involved analysis there that I'm not doing, right? So it's not a bad thing then that I show you the proof. I'll do examples here before you know it, but, um, and we'll talk about it with holes in just a second. Come on, where's my proof? Proof, where's my proof? Ah, here it is, finally. Here is a boring proof for a graph. Suppose you want to prove Stokes' theorem for this graph. So the, the graph's domain is omega, right? The surface that we're looking at is this graph. It's this blue thing. The boundary is a, is, is a couple curves. It's like the C4, C3, um, C2, and C1. Now, I um, minus C3 and minus C2 are actually what I need for the, for the boundary of the surface, but I use the reversal because that makes um, x, a, x a parameter for the curve and that makes y, a, excuse me, x a parameter for this curve and y a parameter for that curve, which are just easier to work with. Okay, so basically I just break down each one of the four boundary curves, C1, C2, C3, C4, um, and they give you, you know, dx is dt, dy is zero, dz is that, and so forth and so on. These are all just based on differentiating the graph on the edge. <coughs> and um, of course, at the, at the top of it all, you have to talk about the parameterization of the graph, which again is given by x comma y comma f of xy. So the curl, the curl, of course, is that as we've talked about before. And come on. Markers are not working for me. Um, so there's your curl. And the normal, remember, is we talked about this the other day, right? Minus partial x, minus partial y1. That's the upward pointing normal. And so I take the dot product of this with the curl. I get these, these terms, partial x, partial, partial x q times partial x, partial f, and this one and that one. <coughs> Excuse me. But then, of course, 
what do I need to do next? I break it into three pieces. I focus on this, this, and this separately. All right? Each one of those is going to break down to like the integral of P. Um, this gives you like the P part of the line integral around the edge, the Q part of the line integral around the edge, the R part of the line integral around the edge. So I just pick on, on the first component. Um, I just say F1 is the P part, OK? So the curl of F1, just the, the, P, the P vector, the X vector component, just gives me that, that first piece here. And um, <coughs> wait a minute, this piece, rather, that minus piece, um, the part with the P's. And then what do we have? We've got uh, the partial, now what do I do going from here to here? What was that? Undoing a product rule. Yeah, I'm undoing a chain rule, actually. It's kind of a reverse chain rule here. If I differentiate this composite function with respect to y, I get partial p partial x, partial x partial y, that's 0. Partial p partial y, partial y partial y, that's just this. And then I get partial p partial z, partial f partial y, which is this. It's just the differentiation of this composite function by y in reverse. It's a reverse chain rule. Okay. And, um, and then, how do you get from here to here? You notice there was, one there was two integrals, now there's just one. Where did, the other, where did the inner integral? Why is there no integral over y? Right, fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, I guess part, part two, I don't know, whatever part you want to call it. But this is the integral of a total derivative. So it's just this thing evaluated at the top minus at the bottom. So the top gives me d, oh, but I, I, the, the minus, yeah. So the top gives me the minus the d, and then the bottom it gives me c. And there you, there you have it. That's star. And then what you can argue is that this is the same as the line integral of f1 around the boundary. If you go back to those four boundary curves, um, uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. yeah. So like the boundary curves of F1 is just the integral around the boundary of S of PDX, but PDX is only non-trivial on C1 and C3 because on C2 and C4 we have DX is zero. Because on C2 and C4 we're just changing in the y direction. All right, they're simple coordinate curves in that sense. And so this gives you that, that gives you that when you go back to the details of the coordinate curves. And that's exactly what we got to from the surface integral of the curl of the p part. But, and then the argument for the, the q component and the r component are much the same. So, you know, you're like, are you going to test me on that? <laughs> no, probably not. I'm not a monster. You guys have enough trouble with just the regular <laughs> divergence and Stokes problems. I don't really need to test you on the proof of this so much. I just wanted you to see it to realize that it is something you could prove if you had time and somebody asked you to. It's not that hard, really. It's really just the chain rule, the fundamental theorem of calculus, and just setting down, OK, this is a graph. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to parameterize the edge carefully, and I'm just going to work through it. It's not nothing terribly, terribly profound. It's just there's a lot of details. But the other thing I'd like you to take from this is just at the base of it, what's really going on here is it's just the fundamental theorem of calculus again, right? Paired with this um, notion of a surface and an oriented boundary, right? That notion of orientation of the boundary was important to get things to cancel out and work like they did. So. But there's a lot of details. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. The Z component's a little bit different. Yeah. Because it's got non-trivial contributions from every one of the curves. <laughs> so if I was to say, oh, we did the P, so the Q and the, the, Q and the R are just the same, that would be disingenuous. <laughs> In fact, the R component's much worse. <laughs> Oh, okay. No problem. We'll post it. Awesome. Thanks. You okay?
Yeah, my ride bailed to get me to Greensboro, and I've got a flight tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Hmm. So is anybody living in Greensboro? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. All right. Have a good break. Hopefully not here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so let me put this away for now. We'll come back to this later. But here. So maybe an example. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, it's still too simple. Sorry, let me make that a three. Okay, so let's let's just do it. What would that be? Oh, and I, I guess I probably should tell you it's a little bit ambiguous until I do what? I need to tell you the the, the, the you know the, the range of the parameters for the curve, right? So from zero to two pi, let's say. OK, so how do we do this? We integrate from 0 to 2 pi. Um, what is f? So this is my, this is x, right? This is y. This is z. Hey, that's nice. So f is just what? It's 0, 0, 3 along that curve, right? And then I take the dot product with gamma prime, which is what? Minus sine t cosine t, 0. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, oh, OK. Um, yeah, oh, OK, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, <laughs> may have made it too simple. I don't know. Uh, OK, so great. Uh, it's fine, 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 fine. So if we were to look at uh, some surface, right? which takes uh, this curve C as its uh, boundary. So for example, what could S be? It could be a hemisphere. What else could it be? What else takes that curve as its boundary? Yeah, a cone, I guess we could do that. Sure, cone, I'll take that. You're thinking like this. I'll take it, all right. How about this? A uh, cylinder. Open, but open bottom. 
that's still a, a piecewise smooth surface which takes the circle as its boundary. Hyperboloid? I don't have that much imagination, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, the point is you can pretty much view this as like a, a bubble and just imagine as long as the ring is fixed and it doesn't get another hole in it, that surface can bow out and do all kinds of, I mean, it could even do something crazy like if that would still, you know, assuming that <clears throat> that curve is still the edge of it. So what I'm getting at is the integral of the flux over such a, such a surface, the, the, the flux of the curl is zero. And you see, the, these surfaces involve Z non-trivially. I'm actually better. Um, F of gamma of t is this. I mean, that is F evaluated at x equals to cosine t, y equals to sine t, but z equals to zero. That's the killer. And you see the curl of F here. I don't think it's trivial. I mean, what's the curl of F look like? So help me, if this is zero, I'm going to cry. I did just make this up, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I prepared it before class. Um, let's see here. So that looks to me to be minus uh, x. The y gives me y. The z, it looks like I've got a z. Uh, minus z, well, okay, that's zero. <coughs> What's that? Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it, yeah, fair enough, yeah. Space curve, yeah. Stupid example. Actually, not such a stupid example. Uh, sphere. Integrate. So think about the proof we just went through. What's the outer edge for like a, a tile, like a, if you tile the sphere? I mean, technically speaking, what I was doing is, especially if you do it with triangles, is known as the triangulation of the sphere. If you think about triangulating the sphere, what are the outer edge of the triangles? There aren't any, they're only inner edges. So what's the boundary of the sphere? It's empty, that's right. So if we apply Stokes' theorem in this case, we get the integral over the boundary of the sphere of f dot dr. But this is the empty set, <laughs> so this is zero. There's nothing especially special about the sphere as far as this argument goes. In fact, the, the integral of a curl over any closed surface is zero by essentially the same argument. Now, this thing I was just showing you, right? There's something, there's a problem to be had in here, right? Where you can trade, 
you can trade the integral around the edge for like an integral of the curl over the surface, right? So you can imagine there'll be other problems where maybe the integral of the curl over the surface is a pain to do, but the integral over the, the line integral around the edge is easy, or vice versa in principle, you know? <clears throat> All right, well, I, I don't really have many, um, I mean, we'll, we'll try to look at more examples perhaps after break, but um, there are some good examples in the notes of Stokes' theorem. This is just a, a pair. I'm going to go on now and talk to you about the divergence theorem, All right, which is our other major theorem this semester that we have left to talk about. What is the divergence theorem? Oh, I forgot to talk to you about Stokes with holes, didn't I? Oops. That's actually important. Oops, 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 oops. How's it go if you have a hole? What if your surface looked like, you know, suppose they had a hole. And so here's the surface. So basically, the same argument I gave for Green's theorem works here again. What you can do is you can break it into two pieces, right? Say the north part of S, or let's say the left part of S, and the right part, right? And you apply the Stokes theorem we already talked about on each half part. You can do that because those, the halves are simply connected even though the whole thing isn't, right? And <coughs> so you have the integral over the boundary of SL of F dot dr plus the integral over the boundary of the right part of f dot dr, right, is actually equal to the integral over the boundary of the whole thing of f dot dr. Now you're like, wait a minute, doesn't, isn't there extra edges in here? Well, yes, there are, but those cross cuts, they do what? Let's see, so this is the orientation, right? So. So there's the orientations we have in mind. We have to consider the hole to be, let's say, clockwise oriented if the, the outside is counterclockwise oriented. Ed, as viewed from above, all right, I mean, there's got to be a normal. So if I look down from the normal and put my right hand up in the direction of the normal, my right hand wraps around in the counterclockwise fashion by the right hand rule, whereas if I point my thumb down, then I'm going clockwise. So the hole is clockwise oriented, whereas the outside is counterclockwise oriented. But if you add the boundary of the left to the boundary of the right, you get the boundary of the whole thing. And on the flip side, by Stokes theorem on each piece, we have the integral over the left half of the curl. plus the integral over the right half of the curl. And that is equal to the integral over the whole thing of the curl. And there you have it. Stokes theorem for a surface with a hole. Again, just like with Green's theorem with a hole, we have, we have to be careful to orient the inside the inside to be oppositely oriented from the outside boundary. Yep. So it's a simple way of putting this. If the holes are oriented the same way, the half the flex goes to that, the flex goes to the hole. Yeah, if, if, the or, if the holes, 
we could look at it this way. Here, here's a different way we could write it. We could say the integral around the boundary, the outer boundary of f dot dr is equal to the integral over the inner boundary of f dot dr um, plus the integral over s of the flux. Now this assumes that they're both counterclockwise. I mean, I guess I sh to do this, I should probably do, I really should probably put a, a minus here. <coughs> to be consistent with my, but let me just, let me, <clears throat> let me state it more as I want to state it, which is the outer counterclockwise boundary, the inner counterclockwise boundary, So like this would be C out, this would be C in. <coughs> if I move it to the same side of the equality, it's negative. But if I move it to the other side, it becomes minus, turns to plus. Why is this interesting? So think about this. What? Does it mean then, if the curl of the vector field is zero on your surface with a hole, it means the work done by the force field on the inner boundary is equal to the work done by the force field going around the outer boundary? In other words, it's the deformation theorem. If we have that the, the vector field has curl zero, the integral around the inside loop is equal to the integral around the outside loop if they're likewise oriented. See that? So if this term is zero, then we get integral around the out is equal to integral around the in. And by the way, that's the three-dimensional. That's the last thing we had to say about that list of four equivalent things in the conservative vector field discussion. So the curl of F being zero on a simply connected surface Right? Well, actually, <laughs> now that's the thing is, if I have, if I have the it's simply connected, I can always take two loops, right? And I can form a surface between those two loops and then apply this argument with the curl being zero. It shows that the integral around, integral around the one loop is equal to the integral around the other loop. And anyway, I can also get path independence from this. I mean, I'm going to stop talking about it. But that, that, that's what we need to do. The uh, curl of F equal to zero on a simply connected space implies that the, um, we have path independence. I mean, I, could, I guess I could do that here. Take two points, P and Q, right? Take two curves like that. Assume the curl of F is equal to zero on U, which is simply connected. Um, you know, and it contains the points P and Q, right? So if you want to envision that, the set U is, it's out here somewhere. I don't know where it is. It's out here somewhere. Anyway, it's, it, this is all fitting inside the simply connected space U, all right? Which is a subset of R3. And then what do you do? Just make a surface, right? So how would you make a surface? Well, just like this, right? <laughs> just any old surface that takes C1 and C2 as the boundary and then apply Stokes' theorem, right? The integral 
And what, what if this is the if this is the surface S, the boundary of S is what? See, this is zero because we're assuming that the curl is zero. And this, on the other hand, well, the boundary of S is what? It's I got to tell you, I mean, which, which side is the normal? Let's say this is the normal side, OK? So then right-hand rule, C, so C2 union with the minus C1. So what does this give us? Integral over C2 of f dot dr minus the integral over C1 of f dot dr is equal to 0, which then gives us path independence for two curves between two arbitrary points in U. So we have path independence implied from the curl being zero. And that's three-dimensional argument. We only had a two-dimensional argument before. <coughs> I would try to bump this up to four dimensions, but I simply don't know what the four-dimensional analog is of the curl in here. Right? We don't know that. I mean, at least I don't know it in here. Maybe you guys know it. I don't know. All right. Now that I've got that out of my system, let us get back to the divergence theorem. Oh, goodness. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, you probably won't be surprised for me to tell you that I could just as well do this with like three holes or four or five or finitely many, right? You just have to add the integral over all the inside holes, you know? Just like we did with Green's theorem with multiple holes. Th there, there's also that theorem. We'll talk more about that after break, probably. Okay, so the divergence theorem. Let's get to it. Say it's the following. If E is a simple solid. With boundary this. So this is outward uh, outward oriented is the positive sense, all right? So you can picture something like this. E is some kind of blob. I guess he may try to make it three-dimensional. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, th it's, 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 it's just a sort of three-dimensional blob. I don't know. What it, whatever. So the boundary, uh, now E is in the inside. I don't know how to indicate that. The whole thing is E, I guess. The boundary of E is just the edge. And the boundary of E is outward pointing normal, OK? Yeah. No, no, it's a solid in the traditional sense. It's a three, it's a three-dimensional solid object. Yeah, like for example, it could be a solid ball, or it could be a cube. Yeah, not not a sphere, but I I do mean ball. I mean so like you know. <clears throat> x squared plus y squared plus z squared less than or equal to 1, for example. OK, that's what I mean by a simple solid is a solid region. It's simple because it doesn't have a hole inside it. OK, so here's Gauss's theorem, I mean divergence theorem says this. The triple integral over E, over the volume, of the divergence of a vector field f dv is equal to the integral of the flux on the boundary. It has some other name in Russian. I don't remember. Ostrogovsky or something. I don't know. <coughs> I assume everything is done by a, has been done by some Russian somewhere. Uh, 
I wish I read Russian. It would be helpful. Anyway, um, that's it. Like, so, for example, um, suppose you wanted to calculate. So let's, let's think about the unit cube. 0 less than or equal to x, y, z less than or equal to 1, the unit cube, right? Calculate the flux. of f of x, y, z equal to z squared um, plus x comma y plus z comma um, x plus y plus z. This is an awful problem. Do you realize what that would mean? It's a cube. There are six separate faces. You'd have to do six double integrals, many of which would be non-trivial, because we have a genuine x, y, z dependence in most of the components, right? I mean, if you actually fleshed this out face by face, it would be a total pain. With the divergence theorem, all I have to do is calculate the divergence of f, which is what? Partial derivative of the first component with respect to x is what? 1. Oh, here, I'll tell you what. I'll take this z and raise you hyperbolic tangent of the cosine of z squared. I mean, you could put whatever you want here as long as it's got no y dependence, it just <laughs> differentiates, right? Uh, 1 plus 1. The divergence is 3. The flux, then, is simply equal to the triple integral of the number 3, dv, over um, 0, 1, 0, 1. Well, I mean, just let's just say we could denote it this way, 0, 1 cubed. It's the Cartesian product of the interval thrice. Uh, what's the volume of a cube of side length 1? It's 1, 3, 3. If you can use the divergence theorem, should you? Yes. I mean, yes. Look for ways to use the divergence theorem. It is, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Feels like it, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, man. A world where this is first grade math. I like your I like your thinking, Mike. Um, remember that problem? We th there are other uses for this, right? So, um, if I have something like a hem like a hemisphere, right? Um, suppose I'm looking at the vector field f equal to. Um, I think we did this one the other day, f x y z, right? And we calculated we did we calculated the flux through. What did we do? We calculated the flux of this through the upper hemisphere of radius r. Did we do that? I can't remember, you guys. Just remind me. We did. Did we do it through a unit hemisphere? Did we do it hemisphere radius r? I can't remember. Radius r. And um, what did we what did we figure out the flux was of f? dot ds through the upper hemisphere. I think I called it hr. Oh, you guys are just going to make me do it again. Fine. r rho hat um, dotted with r squared sine phi. 
do, 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 rho hat, d phi, d theta. Um, we integrate phi from 0 to pi over 2, theta from 0 to 2 pi. And we got ourselves an r cubed and uh, 2 pi. And the sine, I think, 2 pi r cubed, right? Is that right? What's that? What do you say? What? What? E pi r squared. Was this the, was it the same vector field f? Oh, f f f f was z hat. You're saying this. Oh, let me do that then. I'm sorry. So that's different, right? And that one worked out too. Okay, z hat was. We ended up with, uh, I thought that was different. I remember something about a um, u substitution because we got r squared um, cosine phi, sine phi. It, there, there's a, there's a it's sine phi, cosine phi, right? No. Was there a squ can you guys tell me? I can't remember right off the top of my head. I, I, I don't want to write it all out. <coughs> was it cosine squared? <coughs> it's sine cosine? Okay. And so we get, um, we got 2 pi. What did it work out to? 2 pi r squared. Oh, and this, this one, one half uh, <coughs> sine phi, sine squared phi. 0 to pi over 2, which is what? Oh, so we got pi r squared. Oh, right, which made sense, yeah. Now check this out. Now here's another way to, now we said that it made sense intuitively um, because we thought, okay, well, you know, if you look at z hat here, and if you, but let's think about this a different way. If you think about the, um, let's say that this HR, <coughs> so the di we have the disk of radius R unioned with HR is equal to the boundary of something. Let me call it B1 half. It's the half ball, right? It's the upper half ball, like the whole, the solid half sphere. This is the boundary of the solid half sphere, right? However, the dr, this, this, this lower piece, right, it must have this is the normal because it has to point outward, right? So the upper, the normal points up, it points down to be out, pointing out of the, up the half sphere. If we apply Gauss's theorem here, integral over the boundary of the half ball, then what's the divergence of f? Anyway, whatever it is, it should be equal to the flux over the, um, you know, the boundary, which has two pieces, right? dr plus hr, right? Yeah, the, exactly. The divergence is precisely zero because it's a constant vector field. So its divergence is zero, which goes to show you that the integral over dr of f dot ds, right, is equal to minus the integral over hr. Now, what's the deal with the minus? Does that make sense? Why is there a minus there? Didn't I say they were the same? When I said they were the same, I was assuming that the disk was oriented upward. But as it appears on the boundary of the half sphere, it's oriented downward, right? So that's why you have the minus, because 
there's a flux of pi r squared going out of the top, right? There's a flux of pi r squared going into the bottom. In other words, I could draw a picture of something like this, whatever field line comes in here goes out up there. What comes in goes out. So we have a flux into it of a pi r squared through the base, and we have a flux out of it pi r squared through the top. Positive flux for going out, negative flux for going in. Yes? Ah, okay. <coughs> well, yeah, I mean, <coughs> of course, you can actually just, I mean, we don't really need integral calculus to do the flux on the, on the base. The flux on the base is area times magnitude, right? And you put a minus out front because the normal is opposite the direction of the vector field you're calculating the flux of. So, of course, the area is pi r squared. The magnitude is 1, so we get minus pi r squared for the flux through the base cap. Yeah, I don't, I don't even need integration to do that, really. But it was a leap for us last time that that was the same, right, as the, uh, <coughs> integral over the cap. So, you probably won't be surprised to find out that the divergence form of Green's theorem can be used to prove Gauss's theorem. I mean, in other words, the divergence form of Green's theorem can be used to motivate the proof of the divergence theorem. Come on, here we go. So, basically, I just, I just, what I do is I prove the divergence theorem on like a little infinitesimal cylinder. So imagine taking like a little pancake. What would the flux through the pancake come from? So first of all, the only place where the flux can come from in terms of the, um, you know, the, <coughs> excuse me. So if you look at, this was the Green's, the Green's, um, Green's theorem in the plane, said the flux through the boundary of D, right, was equal to the integral of the divergence over, the, over D, well, two-dimensional divergence. but. If you look at this and add, add another vector, uh, add another component, rz hat, and you consider this infinitesimal cylinder like d cross dz, so to speak. Um, so if I, multiply, if I multiply the flux that goes through this by dz, I think that should give me the flux through the, through the red part, right? And then I would have to add the flux through the caps separately to get the total flux through the little, little cylinder. So the horizontal flux I can just get from basically just doing the integration over the boundary of D and then Z plus DZ just add up the flux through each like little, little curve and they, st they stack together to form the horizontal, the, the sides to the cylinder. Um, that would give me the flux through the, through the you know, sort of the, the red piece. That would just involve the P and the Q, right? Because if you think about it, the R, the R component is vertical, so it doesn't cut through that piece. And then on the vertical face, um, you know, you have the S's, you have N hat. Um, <coughs> well, it, I, I say it's also clear that N hat DS DZ is the, is the vector area element on the, on the vertical face. That, that also is pretty natural. ds kind of curves around, right? dz goes up and down. So if you do ds times dz, that gives you the scalar surface area element on the side. That's believable, I think. So what's the, um, the, the down flux and the up flux? Well, the up, the up flux would be you take r, x, y, z plus dz. That's the value of the r component on the upper face. And this would be the value of the r component on the lower